welcome to what has now become part two of the leveraging technology to enhance rather than distract panel discussion. Uh, technology can play a significant role in enhancing uh, visitor experience at a uh, theme park or any other type of attraction. Uh, it can be tricky to get the balance right. Choosing complicated systems can limit accessibility and distract from creating a fully immersive experience. Uh, this panel of esteemed entertainment experts will dive into best practices in how to layer augmented virtual realities, uh, mobile apps, interactive displays, RFID technology, projection mapping, and probably a whole bunch of things that I've completely missed here. Um, when adding new technology to an attraction, uh, striking the delicate balance between distraction and enhancement is critical. With guests of all technical abilities, thoughtful planning can help extend your attraction beyond the physical realm and truly amaze and engage your guests. Uh, our panel here is going to share um, our best practices and give you examples of how you can create consistent and accessible digital experiences. Uh, we're going to start with Adam. Uh, Adam Pear is the VP of Creative Technology for Envoy. Uh, he started his career as a software engineer and designer. After a few years of working on primarily screen-based software, Adam ventured into the world of immersive experiences and interactive installations. He has had the pleasure of designing and building experiences for brands such as Universal Studios, the Chicago Mu Museum of Science and Industry. Ooh, say that 10 times real quick the De Young Museum, T-Mobile, McDonald's, Abbott Healthcare, Harley Davidson, Toyota, Purina, and many more. Uh, Adam, the floor is yours. Hi, hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming down to, to see our talk. Um, today, I'm going to talk to talk about how to, like uh, Andy said, how to leverage technology to enhance rather than distract. Uh, but also sometimes, you know, to distract because sometimes we need it. Um, myself, I'm Adam Peer. Um, I'm VP of Creative Technology at Envoy. Uh, you might have known us by another name called Leviathan a few years ago. Um, we are an experiential design company that focuses in real-time content. Uh, our clients, uh, like mentioned earlier, Andy mentioned, uh, span all the way from branded environments for clients like T-Mobile, all the way to theme park uh, attractions for Disney or Universal. Um, but we're not here to talk about me, so let's talk about how do we leverage this technology. Um, so I'm going to go through basically a couple of our case studies um, and highlight some of our best practices. I think for me, one of the most obvious ones really is to one, make it art. Um, when putting new technology into a place, um, you don't want to just necessarily overload it and, uh, you know, have screens everywhere. But I think uh, using screens to replace uh, what might have usually been uh, some static artwork, uh, <laughs> paintings or uh, images otherwise, uh, with real time content really opens up the space, uh, livens it up. And also systems like this give the opportunity to be able to uh, constantly update include real-time data, include things that you might not uh, have seen, and sometimes even include the, the local community. Um, in some of our more branded environments, uh, for us, a really big thing is making sure that's inviting. Um, we really like to do uh, these simple moments where people walking past uh, our installations will see what we like to call an attract state, where some sort of blob or really cool imagery follows you as you're going through. Um, this really creates that opportunity to kind of take that attention um, and bring people into the actual environment rather than uh, kind of having something that people walk past. It's a little bit of the opposite of uh, not distracting, uh, but uh, I think that's pretty much the point. Um, on the entire opposite end, it's making it invisible. Um, first, uh, often we'll do we'll do the uh, magic mirrors or other uh, sorts of really cool illusions where you're hiding the actual displays and the technology behind something uh, that you might see uh, in a standard uh, location. So here is from our T-Mobile Center. Uh, essentially, we've got a magic mirror uh, so that people you know feel like they're still in the bathroom, but then get all that digital goodness uh, that you get by having a connection to the internet and IoT devices. Um, the next big point really is making it personal. Um, one thing we've found is that 
people really like to see themselves in in the technology and the places that they're going and the places they're being. And if we really want technology to stand out and to to be uh, something that people utilize and is there for a reason, um, bring people into it uh, keeps their attention. So this is an example from our McDonald's headquarter headquarters for their Hamburger University, where people going to to learn about McDonald's uh, and train for their sales position. Uh, go through the entire steps and we bring them into the actual uh, artwork on the floor so they become a part of McDonald's and really feel more like a family. Um, looking into some of uh, our work at in theme parks, uh, you know, since October, I think it was great to make it spooky. Um, here is pretty similar to that uh, T-Mobile example where, you know, we're really hiding that technology behind uh, a semi-transparent mirror and tracking people uh, in order to add really fun little moments um, that eventually become a cool photo takeaway. Um, people really like to to see that they feel more immersed when uh, when interactive uh, digital elements start interacting with them. They can move and actually see it uh, move with them. It feels more personal and it feels more immersive than uh, simply uh, writing through some animatronics. On the other end, uh, we also use it to be extremely distracting. Um, so for Peter Pan's flight at Disney, um, we did basically this sh the shadow play cue line uh, where people could interact with different elements from Peter Pan. Um, if you guys have been to a theme park recently or you know anytime, you know that the lines can be extremely long. And so uh, moments like this add a little bit of fun, a little bit of whimsy uh, to the experience to kind of distract you from uh, that waiting game, the frustrating part of the theme parks and make more of the experience a good time. And uh, this is from some of our, uh, I think most importantly is to make it fun. Um, this is from our recent work at Super Nintendo Land at Universal Studios, um, currently Japan and Hollywood coming to Orlando. Um, and this is a really, really fun game. Essentially, we uh, we expanded on our, our shadow body tracking technology and uh, incorporated into a, a full interactive game where players can bring put themselves into the actual game. Uh, use their body to actually interact with the elements um, and really actually dive, be inside the, the digital game. Um, for us, this is this is really, really important and uh, to, to really take the technology away from it. And yes, you are standing in front of a big screen, but when you're in the space, what you're not seeing are cameras, sensors, trackers, motion. You're really just put right into that magical world of Mario um, and ends up becoming a really fun experience. Uh, it's all minute and 30 seconds uh, where you know you are the characters. Um, I guess looking at all of my examples, uh, <laughs> make it body tracking is kind of where, <laughs> where it feels like it ends up. Uh, it's not exactly what we're saying, but I think uh, body tracking, it just happens to be a tool that uh, and skeleton tracking that we use often uh, to essentially remove those physical um, interface points. So instead of having buttons or dials or touch screens or anything else, the actual body becomes the interface, um, allowing people to interact with digital elements like they would uh, physical objects. Um, and for us, this really helps to create that uh, uh, that sense of immersion. Um, and honestly, it's fun, even if it's not working and you're just kind of moving around with digital objects, people love it. And then when it works and it's absolutely wonderful, like at the Mario game, uh, they like it even more. Um, but to sum it up, I think that for me, the main thing really isn't about body tracking. It's making sure it's purposeful. Um, it's making sure that you're not putting technology in for technology's sake and that there's a reason for it. Um, generally, when we come to a new project, we always like to take a step back before we start scoping technology and say, okay, what is it that we're building? What story are we trying to sell? What's the feeling that we want to evoke? Um, and we really use those to drive the overall decisions for what sort of technology we're using, how we're going to be implementing things um, to really make sure that ultimately it's the experience that people uh, end up remembering when uh, they go home and think about the the installation. And it's not the uh, the touch screen or the weird interaction that they had to do. It's the really fun uh, time that they had and those feelings that they had in the immersion. Um, I'm Adam Peer, uh, again, VP of Creative Technology from Envoy. Uh, my email is adam at weareenvoy.com if anybody wants to follow up and have any uh, further conversations on this. Hey, 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 no, so, no uh, shameless self-promotion there. 
All right, thank you, Adam. That was actually great. Um, all right, we're going to move on to our newest minted TEA master, Mr. Chris Conti. Uh, with 23 years at Electrosonic, Chris Conti is an is instrumental in the company's global success as an executive consultant and global ambassador. His forte lies in AV technology design, showcased in diverse projects worldwide, from the theme parks and spectacles to museums and world expos. As executive consultant, he interprets client visions, imparts technical education, and guides technical direction, adding immense value throughout the process, project cycles, or process, would have been the same. Additionally, as a global ambassador, Chris presents electronics, Electrosonics history, project portfolio, and capabilities to a wide audience, excelling in forging lasting relationships and seeking new opportunities, embodying his extensive experience and expertise in the field. Take it away, Chris. Thanks, Andy. And uh, Adam, well done. You talked about a lot of different technologies, and I'm going to stick to a single technology in, in my presentation, if I can click here. And that's mobile devices, um, or, or mobile apps often are used today. But so technology has been around for a while, and uh, when it's done well, it's it's really an enhancement. But when it's not done well, it can really distract the guests from a museum or an attraction experience. In practical use, you know, they're used for advanced bookings and map maps and visitor guides, even feedback forms to, to feedback to the designers of the park itself. But for enhancing or expanding content. Um, you know, it can offer adding additional related content to the experience, sometimes gameplay, maybe GPS enabled mapping to kind of track the, the visitor's experience, um, obviously used for augmented reality, but also for real time language translation. And I've done a lot of international work in my career and um, language translation is always tough to tackle because you're limited to either language devices that everybody puts on a pair of headphones or uh, changing the whole soundtrack of an exhibit for a specific language. But operationally, it's still done manually, hence the distraction, because you're taking the guest away from the main exhibit and they're looking at their device, trying to figure out how to make it work or how to interpret the, the additional content. And what I'm proposing uh, with these devices is to really take it to the next level. You know, the challenges are it diverts people's attention away from the core guest experience. And it disrupts the storytelling. And that's the biggest problem with these devices. It defeats the whole purpose of visiting a theme park or museum. Uh, and often it's unrelated content, especially when it's not done well. It's, as Adam mentioned, it's the sake of using technology for the use of technology. It's the sake of adding content for the, just because they have extra content. But done well, I think it can offer visitors more of a seamless and personalized experience. Um, it can add you know, personal interactions by auto-triggering location-specific content. And the goal is really to enhance and perhaps make it a more magical experience without the guests even knowing it. So I'm just going to give an example of, of what you can do here to, by, uh, by adding automation. If we just take an exhibit, let's say a, a four-sided media cube, um, we know that we're going to need audio for this exhibit, so we can put speakers in front of each screen to play the specific audio for that video. Um, but we can also add automation devices. Let's just say there we can add some IR control emitters around um, each media screen and create control zones. So you're really kind of defining the experience zones throughout the exhibit. And then if you have a uh, a handheld device, device that you, a custom made handheld device for this example, that um, is fully loaded with the additional content and it, it has the receiver technology for the IR commands. And the system can now track where the vis visitors go and their, and their location in front of each exhibit throughout the entire experience. And that brings up headphone experience. You know, one thing I've always hated is headphone experiences because it really closes you off. It's like, it's like VR goggles. It closes you off from not only the rest of the museum, but the people you're attending it, attending to with. So I've always liked to use open ear design headphones, which allows you to still deliver 
custom audio to your ears, but it keeps your ears open for the experience. And the lower picture shows bone conducting headphones, which in my opinion work extremely well. Um, but again, leaves your ear open to listen to the environment and soundtrack uh, and maybe just deliver language track to your ears. So if we go back to the, the example I was giving in this four-sided exhibit, we've got a couple zones created and as a guest pulls up, well, we know we have to put audio in front of each video screen that kind of matches that, but it's the only soundtrack. It's no, no dialogue track. And as a guest moves up to each exhibit, they have their their device will get controlled by the control system to play back just the language track for that specific video in sync. And as they move from exhibit to exhibit, it ramps down in the old zone and the new dialect track ramps up in the in the new zone, giving you that kind of magical transition from exhibit to exhibit. But my point is adding a little bit of automation to the handheld devices can go a long way in not distracting you by looking at your device and missing the content on the screen, but by magically transitioning you from one piece of content to the next without you even knowing it, without your distraction to the device. Um, and it can work actually quite well. More importantly, you can then prompt your visitors to interact with the device just at the right moment so they don't miss the beats of the main show but you can give them the content that they, that the additional content through the handheld device itself. Again, it's a fully automated and seamless experience. Um, and just for a little bit more cost, obviously, but also just programming, you can really make the mobile devices make much more of a magical enhanced experience rather than distracting each guest. So in summary, you know, you can handle multiple languages, we can handle all auto triggering and playback from exhibit to exhibit in sync, which, I, which is important, of course. Um, additional media content, you can do location uh, tracking for the guests to, to show them where they've exhibited and where they haven't been. Uh, and then this idea of a unique open ear sound reinforcement really works because you can deliver just the language track for the guest and they can still enjoy the, the lush soundtrack from the exhibit itself. Um, and it makes for just a, a much more blended and personal kind of experience, an enhanced experience, I would argue, for, uh, for a theme park attraction or a specific uh, ride or attraction. Um, and that's just one idea how to use mobile devices in a better way. They've been abused for so many years, and I've seen some great cases over the years, but this is one way to really kind of take it to the next level. All right. Thank you, Chris. That was, uh, that's awesome. It's, uh... Now I want to go to those exhibits. <laughs> uh, let's move on here to David Beaudry. Uh, David is an avid technologist and lifelong creative with an ardent passion for finding new ways to bridge these seemingly disparate worlds. His pioneering work in interactive show control software for live music performance for his doctorate in clarinet performance became the foundation for Beaudry Interactive. Evolving into interaction design for live performance, cultural centers, and themed entertainment. David's love for problem solving has led to compelling innovations that make unique use of sensing technologies, embedded computing, and custom show control software, all with a singular mission. Create experiences where people feel that their presence at the moment matters. David, you matter. Take it away. Uh, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, no, I'm thrilled to be here. And I think this is actually a really important conversation to to be having, particularly as as uh, I mean, all of us are trying to answer and ask or ask and answer those questions is like, how do we use technology and what type of technology to use? How does it you know, how do we incorporate into the experience? And so I wanted to kind of take a little step back and rather than talking about specific technologies is to kind of ask the question, why? We are storytellers, experience designers, placemakers. Why, when we're developing these experiences, are we going to use technology? I think it's a really important question to ask. Um, and it's a question that we ask ourselves all the time. Obviously, key to our company um, is interaction design and, and using a lot of technology to make the connections that we need to make in order to have those kinds of conversations and those interactive experiences that we that we want to create. Um, but kind of, again, trying to step back and ask that question as to why we want to use the technology. And 
Um, this I always love putting up this little graphic because it kind of shows the range of what the the type of of you know, a touch points that we want to be able to create. It ranges from a button press. It's the, you know, to answer those, the drive-by moments and those people that just want to go in and get some information or or have a quick experience and then move on all the way up to something that is more thoughtful, more meaningful, and more, more engaged. Um, for us, in no matter what the approach is, it's all about agency. And what I mean by that is that it's basically it's giving people the ability to affect their own experiences. Basically, you're telling them that their presence at that time matters. How do you do that is, is really important to, especially to the work that we do, is trying to create those handles. And technology has been a fantastic tool for being able to do that, whether or not we're trying to sense what people are doing, as what Adam was showing with the skeletal tracking and, and Chris was saying with the handheld devices, using that as a conduit, or are we using presence and touch and buttons and things like that to you know, provide the input using displays and sound and lighting design as the output? The important thing with the use of technology is that your ultimate goal is that you want to create an experience where the people feel like they are getting that once in a lifetime experience that, that it's it's the it's the avatar it's the ICU you want them to they want to be recognized and it can be with the simple interaction but again it can be something that's a lot more more complex um, to give just two quick examples of what I mean by this with the range, um, we did a project several years ago for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and they have an amazing collection of videos that, you know, a lot of them were just, you know, high speed uh, uh, videos that were showing, for instance, like a rattlesnake, you know, catching, uh, catching a rat. And the problem that they were facing constantly was that, you know, they put these videos up and no one was paying attention. It became wallpaper. It wasn't until we kind of came up with a, with a fun idea with the team was, well, let's actually create that sense of agency. So in this example here, we put those videos in little portals. Nothing happens until you lean in. You are telling the environment, you are telling the experience that you are interested. And at that moment, then you present the content and then that's when people are starting to, you know, that's when retention gets a lot higher. That's when you start, you know, elevating the interest in the subject material, um, rather than it just becoming scenery in, in, in the background. So that's kind of the equivalent of a little bit of a button press, but again, adding that sense of agency, agency to it. The other extreme for that is a, a more recent project that we did, which was which was Big Bird, um, and basically giving him a voice. So we're using a lot of gesture technology, a lot of show control, um, to basically give agency to the performers, not the guests, but to the performers. The guests are coming in there to have coming to the experience to have a, you know, an intimate, you know, uh, interaction with with Big Bird, and usually. With uh, prior to, to to this, it's it's you go, you meet, the, you know, the characters are doing little, you know, big gestures, and then they move on. Um, one of the things that um, we know it's frustrating, particularly for the little kids, but we also know that it's frustrating for the performers is that they can't communicate, they can't really have a dialogue, um, particularly the way that the that the guests would be expecting, um, either from you know from based on TVs or movies or anything like that. So uh, what we did in this case is that we recorded Matt Vogel, who is the, the voice of Big Bird, we had about 700 different sound bites in there. Uh, it came up with a system where the performer inside is actually in 100% control of the experience on whether or not he's walking around a park or doing a meet and greet and doing the different stages of the meet and greet um, or, or taking pictures or any of that sort of, the, the sort of stuff. The performer is actually in control and can now have a dialogue. They are now the agents. They are now the ones creating that special experience as we've given them the power to be able to, to, to create those special, those special moments. And I think what's important when we're talking about all these different things with the technology is looking at where does the technology fit? How am I creating agency? How am I engaging with the guests? What are those handles that I'm creating? And then start figuring out, is that technology that I want to use, is it simply that I just want to put it because it's, it's new and cutting edge? 
or does it have a more uh, substantive uh, use within the experience uh, that we're creating that we're creating. So um, I think it's I think what I really look forward to, uh, hopefully we'll have a bunch of time in the end to kind of kind of really kind of hone in on on the why we want to use technology. I think it's I think that's one of the key things when we're trying to trying to incorporate it. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll do a really quick anecdote. Um, we were working with a science center and uh, we carried this kind of high tech scavenger hunt. And it was in the early stages. We had no facades, nothing up or anything like that. All it was was exposed technology, tracking people throughout the space and and answering, asking and answering questions. And the head of uh, education was was not pleased. She's sitting there. It's like the librarian scowling at you in the corner and wondering what in the world you were doing. And it wasn't until at the end when basically we really started to focus on the content and say, all this tech that you see disappears. It's never about the technology. As much as it breaks my heart when people come out of experience and don't talk about the technology, we know we failed if it, has, if it is about the tech. So again, trying to keep in mind the sense of agency, making the technology disappear and really focusing on the experiences and stories and using that and using technology more as a tool, I think is really, really key, um, particularly for the approaches that we often take for the type of work that we do. Um, and that is what I have to share. <laughs> I love it, David. That was great. All right, let's move on to Michael Libby. Uh, Michael Libby, CEO of World Builder in Los Angeles, is a prominent creative technologist with 15 years in the immersive industry. Specializing in location-based entertainment, he, met, he merges tech prowess and creative problem solving to deliver solutions that are both innovative and practical. Proficient in AI, AR, VR, many more initials, uh, Libby stays at the tech's, at tech's forefront, aiming to supply these advancements, to apply these advancements, to help his clients succeed creatively and practically. Serving as a trusted advisor to companies around the world, his unique blend of technical know-how and creative vision empowers companies to leverage technology for growth and transformation in location-based entertainment. Michael, floor is yours. Thank you. And I do have to be transparent in saying that that was definitely written by Chat GPT. Um, awesome. <laughs> so, um, Thank you, Chat GPT, for the tongue twister in there. Appreciate it. Okay. So uh, let me pull up my presentation here. So um, we are talking about uh, whether to use technology to enhance or distract. And uh, my my whole thing is, we can't wait until the attraction opens to figure out what is enhancing and what is distracting. Um, mm -hmm. And now we can do that uh, during the design and production process using digital twins. Um, now, what is a digital twin? Well, uh, perhaps you've seen the scene in the first Avatar movie uh, where they're, you know, the the military is is looking at the forest setting and where all the unobtainium deposits lie. Um, or perhaps you remember this from the Westworld TV show on HBO, uh, where all the game designers were crowded around this, uh, projection map surface of, of the actual gameplay area that was Westworld. Um, or of course, you know, from the Iron Man movies where Tony Stark was, was building, um, his Iron Man suit. Uh, these are all examples of digital twins. And digital twins are, uh, are much more than 3D models. Uh, we'll get into that in just a bit, but they are smart models that also include all of the embedded systems. Uh, so you can see how they interrelate and interoperate. Um, and digital twins really allow us to ask the question, what if we could predict failure? Uh, what if we could mitigate risk by simulation and pre-visualization? Uh, to see if some of these technologies that we're stacking on top of each other uh, do enhance from the experience or distract. Um, so again, it's all of the intrinsic systems in addition to the 3D model. So if you're making a digital twin, say, of a heart, 
it's not just the heart, but it's all of the valves and the, you know, the blood movement and, and all of the systems. If you're creating a digital twin of a, of a race car, it's not just the 3D model of the car. Uh, it's the actual physical properties and the aerodynamics. And if you are uh, creating a factory, it is the time between stations and the, you know, much like, much like a theme park ride, the throughput that you get from actually uh, operating these things. And um, there are different levels of digital twins. Uh, and this is language from the Unity game engine that they've provided. And um, the most basic one is a virtual twin uh, or a realistic representation of an asset uh, that sort of mimics its real world counterpart. Um, then you also have a connected twin that integrates real time and right time data uh, from sensors that are connected to the actual physical environment. Uh, then you have a predictive twin uh, that can actually predict outcomes um, based on simulation. And then you have a prescriptive twin uh, that actually can model out future scenarios and then come up on its own with, pre with prescriptive analytics and recommendations. And finally, the fifth is the autonomous twin that can do all of these things at once and can self-operate by uh, both predicting and prescribing solutions to some of your issues. Um, so, a uh, digital twin is going to be the next big buzzword, I think. Uh, we, we've just been through the metaverse hype cycle, and we're right in the middle of the AI hype cycle. And I, I believe that digital twin is going to be the next big buzzword. Um, but it is more, as I said, it's more than just a 3D scan. It's more than just a 3D model. And so we're going to see that word start to be uh, misused as a buzzword quite regularly. Um, but now you are all smarter than that. This is not a digital twin. This is just a 3D scan. Uh, of the Titanic, but it does not have any of the uh, systems that were in operation when, when the boat was actually operating. Um, digital twins also allow for you to, to, to plan uh, during your design and construction and production phases. Um, and you know what, these videos are supposed to be looping, but that didn't translate for some reason. Uh, but the point is, um, Digital twins can now also allow for what's called uh, 5D planning. So it's, it's again, much more than your 3D model, but your fourth dimension is time, uh, where you can actually see a sequenced uh, project develop and understand what's going to happen when during the construction process. Um, and the fifth dimension is money. What is your spend going to be as your project develops and gets built? What is, you know, when does the concrete get poured and how much is that going to cost? That sort of thing. Um, digital twins. This is an example of a connected twin on a bridge where sensors are in place. Um, and this was actually something where uh, this very well may have saved lives where a sensor was, uh, was tripped and it was sent to the digital twin that was being monitored and uh, there was a fault and the bridge instantly shut down operation as part of its uh, prescription for that problem that it found. Um, digital twins are increasingly being used in factory settings. Um, again, as I mentioned before, so you can really understand timing, uh, bottlenecks, throughput, and things like that. And if you look at this video that I'm sharing right now and you kind of squint your eyes at it a little bit, it looks a lot like a dark ride um, with one vehicle going to the next scene and the next scene after that. And um, that's basically what we do at World Builder is, is we create digital twins so that we can uh, incorporate all of these different pieces uh, of, of an attraction as it's developing, the media, the audio, the uh, the ride profile, the movement of a KUKA arm, all of these things together. Um, again, if you can visualize them together in a digital twin, you're not surprised uh, post-opening. And you can really get a sense, again, of what is enhancing and what is distracting from the experience. Um, it's just a, a quick side view of that, where you can see there's that KUKA arm uh, that guests are riding on. That orange area represents the reach envelope. The safe area for guests to reach. Um, 
that that green triangle represents the projector throw. Uh, there's media being projected onto that curved screen, and the whole the whole name of the game here is getting that vehicle as close to the screen as possible uh, without crossing into that projector throw because that would uh, cast a shadow onto the screen. And you have to understand that these um, these different these these different components are all being created and installed by different companies, um, and everyone thinks their component is the most important. But uh, if if these uh, different vendors are allowed to collaborate within a digital space prior to opening, we can really work out these things first uh, within the digital twin space. And really, the best comparison for attractions uh, is a piano roll. Uh, one of those self-playing, self-playing, you know, player pianos uh, that have those rolls with with the holes punched out um, that play a song. That's that's really that's really what's at the core of many of the experiences that we create, uh, regardless of what technology you use. It's um, it's you know playback of a predetermined sequence or or scroll of events uh, via lighting and audio and multimedia. Um, but in a digital twin, uh, you're allowed to get all of the keys together at once um, during the development and the design of the project, as opposed to after the fact. Um, and if if you're on a project where uh, vendors are not communicating with each other um, until they get to the field, it's it's really like like one vendor has been tasked with programming the first 10 keys of the keyboard the next uh vendor has been tasked with the next 10 keys of the keyboard and so on and so forth so um unless they're able to to share their work in a digital space during design and development uh there there will be some unexpected uh uh results when you get closer to opening um Digital twins, again, also as it relates to us, um, you know, throughput is a is a huge part of our industry and what we do. And uh, even something as as small as a dispatch interval change for a ride vehicle can have an enormous effect on an attraction's throughput. So by gauging throughput and demand, we can actually have a, a, a much better idea um, of of what of how the attraction is actually going to be used. Um, and in terms of whether uh, this content is is distracting or enhances the experience, we can now actually program some of these digital experiences within a digital twin, uh, like an AR overlay. We can now create an AR experience within a game engine, and you know see where the the AR items are spawning in in the three dimensional space, so that guests can collect them and add them to their inventory and that type of thing. Are there too many? Are there not enough for the demand of guests? All of these things can now be figured out virtually uh, before they're produced physically. Um, so digital twins are going to be a $48 billion industry by 2026 and a $78 billion industry by 2032. Uh, and it's just a smarter way to, to build things and see if your attraction does actually, in fact, have the technology uh, fall away and fall by the wayside when it actually opens or if it is distracting to your guests. Um, so that's what I have to present. Thank you. Michael, you had me at KUKA. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has me at KUKA. I don't know. Ah, uh, no, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, now, are we talking to the real you or your digital twin? <laughs> Can't say. I had to zing one in there. Photo real, photo real. Ooh, hey now. Just a question of uh, level of uh, level of detail there. All right, let's move on uh, to our last presentation here. Uh, we're gonna go to Trailer Woodall. Uh, Trailer Woodall is a lifelong storyteller, artist, musician, and experience creator. His journey began with a traditional degree in graphic design, but during a college internship, he discovered a passion for motion graphics. Many years later, Trailer now serves as the CEO and founder of Five Stone Studios, an integrated production company that blends design, technology, and storytelling to create visually rich narratives across a wide range of channels. After 25 years in the industry, he lives for the moment when a creative idea comes together, 
that is greater than the sum of any one individual's ability or effort. Aren't we all? Let's go team fun. Trailer, take it away. All right. What an honor, guys. Super excited to be here. Um, before I pull up my deck, I, I got to say, it's been incredible just hearing. It's like all these incredible lenses looking into this beautiful room called technology. And it's just neat to see everyone's perspective. Um, so super thrilled to be here. Yeah, just um, wait till y'all start arguing about it. Yeah, exactly. That comes next. Um, Give it a minute. Yeah, so I, I'm going to take a little just... A little more back. I I, I liked uh, some of the ideas of backing up a little bit, and I want to talk about creating connection. Obviously, uh, leveraging technology to enhance rather than distract. Um, and I'm just going to walk through three projects that kind of touch on this. And it's interesting um, when COVID happened. I felt there was a real shift. We became aware as a world and as a globe of people what our deep need for community and connection is. And so I think one of the ways my angle or lens on this was looking at things and, and honestly the spike in demand we've seen where people are coming to us trying to solve, how do we create community? Um, how do we create connection? And so I've just got three of these that I'm going to share. They're not, you know, any end all <laughs> so a couple of things that I think would be good. I think my biggest takeaway that I would like for all of us to do is let's not just have COVID happen. So we're trying to create connection. Um, it should be the ongoing effort. How do we create community, healthy conversation and uh, connection with technology? So that's, that's the takeaway. If I don't show slide. Um, these particular examples, um, we did use a mobile phone as input because in these particular situations, it's just, it's just people are so comfortable with it and you'll see how that works. Again, the goal in all of these was to create community and connection, particularly in a time when that was very challenging. Uh, and then we wanted to make art become participatory, uh, more of a conversation where, where people aren't just voyeurs, but they're involved and engaged. And so um, I think those are all healthy goals uh, for technology. Um, this one, uh, going to call it creating avenues for gratitude, and you'll see this quite a bit. Um, you feel like we just were on this gratitude thankfulness uh, trip for about two years, but we just had a lot of projects that involved this. But this was actually for a hospital uh, where it was coming out of COVID, and um, the co you know all the healthcare workers were just hammered, you know, just exhausted, um, destroyed in their psyches and emotions and so they wanted to come up with a a type of um, a method for the community to give back to express gratitude and so it was an art installation uh and it was a tree of gratitude and pretty simple you know people can come up with their phone they experience this art installation it's, it was built in unity for those of you that care uh, but it was a constantly blooming tree that uh, we set up all these camera moves and camera paths to fly around but what it was fed on was actually statements of gratitude. Um, people could walk up, they read this, say, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I am thankful. They could use their phones, went to a little microsite, type in what you're thankful for. Uh, by the way, you could also share that online and share it on social. And you it would, it would plant a little leaf online that could uh, kind of spread the word of what this was doing. But then what would happen is the camera would then fly up to the tree. They'd see their little leaf of gratitude bloom and they would add to this tree. It changed throughout the seasons, changed with time of day, and it was kind of in a painterly effect. But the result was it had a tremendous effect for just in bringing encouragement and then allowing people to kind of join a movement of gratitude. Uh, let's go to the next little fun one. Uh, this was actually a, a kind of a cool thing. This did not show up in a physical sense, but it was all social online. But um, we were approached by a music label and strangely enough, Florida Georgia Line, and you may know of them, um, they uh, had a big collaboration uh, project that they put together, but they invited fans to participate in a music video. And we were able to do, we developed their own kind of real-time render engine and people could, same thing, go to a microsite, in fact, upload some pictures of what they're grateful for. And then uh, pretty soon in like a minute or two later, they get their own music video. Uh, where they're starring in and now joining in a movement of gratitude, thankfulness, and being able to share it online and spread spread the word. So 
I think that's a pretty good use for building community and some positiveness with thanks uh, technology. Here's the last one. Uh, and this is a project we're actually currently involved in. So the, it doesn't have a name to this, but um, this is a kind of a civil rights uh, group that we're working with. And the idea here is to create this beautiful flowing river of um, almost like stained glass. And it's, it's, it's uh, at the closing of a big uh, tour that you go through where you learn a lot about civil rights and taking a stand. And there's kind of this holy moment, almost like an altar call where we uh, invite the participants to um, make a stand, to take a stand. And they actually join in this piece of art. Uh, and what's interesting, they're time stamped uh, at the moment that they make that decision. And with their phones, they're able to go in and say, hey, you know, I'm going to use my rights to stand up for others, or I'm going to make a stand. And then uh, this beautiful, their quote and the time that they make that decision shows up and joins this wall. And uh, that is um, my little three ideas. And so I guess the conversation I want to bring to this is how can we create conversation? How can we create community? How can we make it collaborative and a two-way conversation? And so those seem to be the trends that we're operating in at the moment. And that is my presentation. Keep it short and sweet. Thank you. Oh, Charlie, that's great. I love the fact that for a video guy, you showed all still images. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was to do the animated GIFs, but I just held off. Oh, come on. Such restraint. Look at this guy. <laughs> Got to love it. Um, you also win the award for the best accent out of the whole group. Just had to give it to you. It's a good thing. You just make me want to say y'all, and I love that. Oh, all right. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, people start filling up my uh, chat with questions here, please. I don't want to talk anymore. Uh, we're going to bring it back out from our uh, SATE presentation less than a week ago. Um, uh, going to reintroduce Brant Underwood, um, Val Siganevich, if Val's battery hasn't died yet. And standing in for his brother, uh, we've got Peter McGowan representing Mel McGowan. Uh, Greg Catano, still having transport issues, is on a delayed flight. <laughs> I can't make it up. I can't even. <laughs> it's so good because it's true. Uh, so Greg will not be able to join us, although if he happens to land early on his delayed flight, perhaps uh, we'll get a cameo at the end. Um, all right, I'm going to pop over to the chat. And oh, come on, people. Someone, something. All right. Uh, in the meantime, while we get some uh, audience questions here, um, we had a lot of uh, buzzwords here uh, purposeful, uh, transferable agency. Uh, I'm going to throw out a couple more buzzwords here and uh, one at a time and just let you guys chop on them and have some uh, discussion about it. Uh, I'll start with a softball. How about suspension of disbelief? Mm. Mm. Conti's got his hand up. Uh, I just want to point out, I, I appreciated David's question of why, because it's kind of important because sometimes technology itself can be the distraction of the storytelling. And I think it's an important question to ask all our clients you know, why do we want a particular look or feel? Why do we want technology? And if it really doesn't serve the song or serve the story, then uh, it's, you're probably on the wrong track. So it's it's a good question to ask up front before we decide if technology is a disruption, disruption or an enhancement. Good. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> good point, David, really. No, that, that's a good observation, Chris. Appreciate that. No, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really key because as we're, I mean, we're, we're all, you know, it's like the siren in the distance, right? It's always calling us the new technology, the new, you know, the new thing that we all, and we all want to try to figure out how to incorporate it because we want to feel, want to make our projects and the work that we do feel relevant in some way, whether it's, whether it's in the front of our conscious or the back of our conscious, it's, it's, it's it, in a way, that's one of the reasons why we try to embrace technology, but 
I think one of the one of the hard things is to say is to ask those questions is to is to why and ask your client those questions. A lot of the stuff I know is driven by our clients. I mean, all of us here probably have realized that our clients are the ones who are driven by the candy and, and all the sparkly stuff. And so it, you, we spend a lot of our time just trying to, to ask that question of our clients as well. It was like, OK, why? Why are we taking, you know, putting VR goggles on 11 year olds? You know, what <laughs> when you invited them to a beautifully built out space, but you're going to put goggles on. Them. Why? Not only for the demographic, but again, you got a beautiful built out space. So asking those questions, not saying anything negative about any of the technologies, but having it be purposeful to what you want to accomplish in that experience, I think is really key for for its use. Otherwise, it just ends up just being noise too. I think in the in the end. Yeah, it jumping. Is, oh, yeah, it jumping is, there. Uh, it is the distraction. Right. Go ahead, Adam. <laughs> no, no, I'm the distraction. You go. <laughs> no, that's the point. I mean, sometimes if you're putting in technology, it is actually the distraction from the storytelling. And if the client says because it's cool, then you know you're on the right on the wrong track for sure. So. Get them back on track. Right. Right. Yeah, I think it was actually going to be my question was, what do you do when the client is wrong? Tell them they're wrong. Yeah. it's. I mean, a lot of times we've done it where we've had to actually show it. I mean, it's not, you know, you go, you go down that path a little bit, you know, just saying, okay, let's see what this is and get them. It's, you can't lecture, right? We've all been, we, you know, a lot of our clients, you can't sit there in front and say, you know, that's wrong and we're going to do it this way. You have to have them have the same process that you did to make those conclusions. And so, I mean, obviously on a bridge time scale or however you need to. So figuring out how to walk them down that path of, you know, this isn't really the right choice and here's why. Get them to see that at some level and, that makes your life a lot easier. So sometimes you do have to kind of walk down that path. Just, you know, just don't do a really good job, you know, overly good job of making it all sparkly. And then they, that's all they want to want to see. But I think, I, I think spending the time to help them come to the same conclusion that you have, I think is important for, for particularly for the stubborn clients that want to hold on to some of the tech that you don't think is appropriate. Yeah. I, I agree with David's point about the purpose. I think it's uh, it's important to understand what the purpose of fusing uh, one another's technology, and it's always uh, usually leads to the question, uh, what the story behind this purpose. So, and if, 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 if there is a story and it helps to tell the story, so yes, but it, and in in this case, it makes sense to use one another technology. If not, maybe you can explain. So it's not it's not telling the story. And Andy, I think you you let out, you mentioned the suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. That's a, we always lean into that because it is about the story, but you can tell a story and people might not go along with you, but to actually get them to fall into the story, suspend disbelief and, you know, make a decision that they're going all in, that that's the the best thing that we can do to where they actually believe this is real, this is really happening, or that the this love story is unfolding the way that they they think it should. But then the question becomes, how? I know that's always the challenge. Yeah. But. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It is great storytelling that compels people to make emotional decisions. And that's the thing is even like when they make, they choose what brands they like, why are they big Apple fans or whatever it is? Those are all the emotional decisions. And, and really when we use technology, if it's ever distracting to the story and removes them out of the suspension of disbelief, that's usually our flag. We're like, you know, it, it's great. You can work it into the story as well as you want, but if, if it actually doesn't help the story advance, um, yeah, then then we then we cut it. All right, so I got a question in here from the audience. Um, guys, I'm going to get to all of them. They're actually filling in. So uh, everyone, please keep posting. Uh, to those on the panel who are in technology in the technology development space, how are you choosing what is needed versus what would be cool? Secondly, most clients don't have time for research and development. So they like proven tech requiring new tech to be developed without an end user. Have at it. Yeah, I can jump right into there. Um, big one for us is uh, 
you know, it's hard to do because, you know, sometimes the cool technology is the right one, but you don't want that to be the leading factor. Um, for us, a big thing is prototyping. Um, literally uh, kind of similar to the digital twins, but not on, on that full level. Um, pretty much any project that we jump into, we're prototyping, we're doing a bunch of tests, seeing what it looks like from content uh, to the actual physical space, or making VR scales, things like that, really to try it beforehand so that we can get something in, in our client, in front of our client without having to take them somewhere else. Um, and so really being able to show them quick prototypes, iterations really lets you dial down, show how the technology works and how it tells that story without um, making the full commitment uh, to actually go and purchase the $100,000 of equipment. And I'll say this too, I think um, when you really flip the story from this cool technology idea to what does your user, what does the visitor need to experience? And when you really get into the visitor journey and the customer journey, that can help uncover, oh my God, that's a horrible idea. And they can help see that themselves. A lot of times we'll, we'll also pull like quickly, like, guys, let's pull case studies. And so you can pull examples of where this doesn't work, where that does work, but there's a lot of client education. And really instead of making their, that I bad idea of the enemy, uh, what we want to do is make the visitor the hero. And we want to make that that customer, that uh, audience member going through, they're, they're the hero, serve them. And then all of a sudden, I think people can sometimes let go of this thing if they really get to the point of let's serve the visitor in their journey. So let me just throw another aspect into the conversation. Um, generally speaking, in all of your processes, um, you know, your design processes collectively, how much space is built in for R and D just in the normal process of doing what you do, as opposed to, you know, we just got just enough time and budget to, you know, conceptualize it and execute it. Are you building any R and D into your process as a general practice? Yeah, we generally always have a, a level of R&D. Um, most of the time, our clients are going to tell us, well, one, I'm going to say there is no general project. All of ours are wildly different in scope, scale, size, and time. Um, most of our, our clients, if we tell them that we're going to be doing R&D, they say, oh, we don't really want that. Um, so generally, it's not necessarily always something that we will tell them that we're doing, but it's something that we're doing anyway as part of that initial design process. And for us, that really is part. We've got our creative di directors working on that story and their narrative. And then we also have uh, us working alongside doing some of that R&D. Um, the only times where I ever get a client that says, yes, we want to do R&D is from some of our best clients like Universal or Disney, where they're like, we've got this idea. We don't know how it's going to work help us figure out how it's work. And then the project itself becomes R&D. Um, so yeah, it definitely varies, but for us, it's really sneaking that R&D in uh, behind the scenes and helping that drive the create, helping that push the creative story forward. And yeah, I get that. We, we do a lot of uh, a lot of proof of concept, right? So, you know, you, you have you can you can have a fantastic idea, but ultimately you really need to put some time and effort into making sure that you can bring that to fruition in a real way. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes that proof of concept phase, even in, which I consider to be kind of a, a, a pre R&D phase in many ways, uh, you know, really helps to 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 push that idea along or help it stop in its tracks if it needs to sometimes. Yeah, I think that's the flip side. It's the <laughs> positive, positive, how a positive result and a negative result are the, you know, the hmm. equally valuable, right? And being able to do that. Yeah, we spend uh, ourselves too, we spend, I say about 40% of our time doing R&D uh, internally with the, as a company. And again, Adam, to, to your point is like most of the clients say they're not going to pay for it. And then B, there's usually not a time once you're in a production cycle or in that kind of cycle. So we do, we do spend a lot of time behind the scenes for ourselves asking sometimes those what if questions, particularly if a new tech comes around and we want to figure out how it works. Or we want to figure out, you know, there's a particular type of exchange or something that we'll we'll do the we'll do a little bit of the R and D. But going back to Andy, what you were saying, that is always a challenge with our clients. It's like mm -hmm. they want to be the first, they want to be cutting edge, but they want proven tech that's off the shelf in a box. So it's like they want all those, all those things <laughs> together. It's like that's not that's not they can't exist in the same in the same world. So it's almost like you want to actually reach behind you on your bookcase and pull out the, the box and said, here is your experience and congratulations. So it's it's a challenge though, but I think a lot of it comes down to not, I mean, 
we're, we're uh, obviously the way we talk a lot here is that we're talking from the beginning and then into the end, but there's always this process in between. And a lot of it for, I know for a lot of us is that play testing process, right? So we, mm-hmm. I know it's not just us, but a lot of us started right from the beginning, even with paper tech, we're bringing guests in to start figuring out if these particular types of exchanges, whether it's the technology or just even the design itself, works or won't work so we can try to answer those things really quickly or start marking those points that need the r d effort in order to answer those you know answer those questions and keep things moving along but i think i think play testing is a big big factor of that as well answering those now on on the other side of that i mean i'm just going down the rabbit hole with you so (laughs) let's say you're doing you're doing r d kind of independent of projects or specific work where is the let's call it ethical line of, hey, I've got this great thing. This is what you need versus, hey, I got this great thing that almost meets your need, but doesn't really. Where's that line in this discussion? I do a lot of R&D. Chris has his hand up, yeah. (laughs) I, I can answer that on some level from my perspective as a systems integrator. You know, we owe it to our clients to help them manage risk, right? So at the end of the day, they want to build an attraction, do something new. You, you're going to need some level of R&D to get something different and unique that is earmarked for their project. But you also have to be responsible and and not put their project or their company at risk by having too much R&D that could fail and, and spoil the entire soup. So, you know, we as integrators research technology and basically determine is it ready for prime time or not for this particular project and help them educate them and they make the, the decision about how much mm-hmm. they want in R&D. But, you know, our job as a researcher is presented to them and have, really help them be responsible businessmen on some level. That's good. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Look at across my list of people's here. Um, all right, let's go. Uh, let's shift gears. Mike, here. Michael has a point. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, go, Michael. I didn't oh, see thanks. Hand. Thanks. Yeah, I was. I was. I was just going to mention that. Um, let me lower my hand here. That uh, a lot of R and D, like lots, lots of coding and lots of tech, is is taking a task, the task that you want the client that or that that the client wants, the end result, taking a task and breaking it up into smaller tasks. Um, this is a big thing that I've learned in software development is lots of these tasks can actually be smaller and granular tasks. And actually a lot of those smaller things are not R and D efforts. They have been figured out already. Um, so it really is just a question of, of really communicating with the client. You know, the, these are the risk areas. These are the things that have not been figured out, but most of it on, you know, we'll take this and we'll combine it with this other thing in a new and interesting way. Um, but a lot of the components are already out there. Uh, that's, that's what I found anyway, that, that you, you can de-risk R and D by, by breaking it up into small parts and just, just explaining and communicating to your client at every step of the way where, where the actual risk is. No, exactly. Yeah, just it's almost like we become curators. Levels. Right. It's almost like we become curators of, of, you know, of, of tech that we know works and putting it together in a particular way for that unique experience. So it's that's uh, and that's and it's yeah, part of that R&D effort that I'm sure all of us have gone through is, is, go through is is related to that. It's just making sure that, you know, what is out there and then being able to, to answer, answer the question. But uh, but Andy, that's a really good question, too, of trying to. That is a, it always is a fine line. It was like, well, yeah. well I've got a product here. So, <laughs> but well, I, you know, it's, it's also, we're, we're a non commodity. We're, we're the most non commodified commodity out there. Right. You know, we, we don't want to call ourselves a commodity and we don't sell a product, but boy, howdy, it helps to sell product. Right. 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 But if the emphasis is on the product of what it is that you are, the ideas and how you are bringing things together. Yes. Yeah. It's a little bit of a, diff- a different approach. I mean, yeah, right. it's, it's a challenge. I mean, you want to try to be tech agnostic for most of the things up to the up to the last minute, where you start making decisions on what you know what technology is going to drive yeah, implement something. Right, but at some point you have to start making decisions, and whether it's the stuff that you're that you know works because you've worked with it and you've gotten your hands dirty, mm-hmm. or it's something else, then it's, it's that's that's that decision happens once the experience is figured out and then figuring out what the right tools are in order to make that 
make that work. Yeah. Okay, let's a uh, little gear shift here. How does inclusivity get worked into these technological marvels? Uh, for example, wheelchair user for a body scan while keeping it accessible. Um, yeah, that's honestly a, a big, anytime you're designing something for, for theme parks, uh, that's a huge, ADA accessibility is a huge deal and something that we personally like had to do a lot of R&D for our project with Universal um, for the Super Nintendo Land. Um, uh, essentially, the the tech that we originally decide, uh, designed, you know, obviously you're you're tracking a person who's standing up, who has two arms, two legs, uh, can move around with full mobility, um, and generally a lot of uh, AI uh, machine uh, learning tracking methods will look for the entire parts. They'll look for your hips, they'll look for your legs and the other the other parts, and really try to uh, fill in the body. And we actually found that uh, we had to make a, an implementation change at one point. And uh, during that process, we found that wheelchair users weren't being tracked. Um, and so that became a whole sprint in of itself of R&D and really trying to make the system work so that it can cover all of those different use cases. Um, and it's difficult because, you know, uh, if you're doing a touch screen, you have to accommodate somebody who's lower to the ground versus someone who's much taller and can uh, reach high up. And so uh, getting those considerations through means a lot of R&D, a lot of testing and, uh, you know, sometimes throwing things out, starting over and going back to the drawing board. I think it's really important to be empathetic to your audience, right? There's going to be a lot of different people with a lot of different experiences and you really want to be inclusive as you as we all develop these sorts of uh of these sorts of attractions and so you know it's a great question to ask and it's it's fantastic that that, that is even being uh, discussed in this sort of a forum but we really need to keep that uh, forefront in all of our minds as we develop these sorts of attractions is it needs to be inclusive so that everybody can have the opportunity to um to kind of uh, engage in that suspension of disbelief and and, and experience something that's like truly remarkable uh, so yeah, we need to think about all those different demographics as it relates to that as well um, as as we go through that process. Okay, I got another question from the audience here. Oh, a question with a clarification. I love it. This is what happens when you let it sit for too long. Uh, feeling like this panel gave me a range of vocabulary on themed entertainment tech, but much of it feels expensive, high level, adult. In what way do you want slash expect students to use this vocabulary? And then before we answer, or rather, what is the student's place in this kind of consulting? Is there a place for us here? The answer is yes. Y'all tell me why. I can be all over that. So yeah, we love, um, there's so much the projects that we're in right now, we need voices. And the more people that you can bring to the table in user testing, user experience, um, we have a, a whole thing where we actually love to pull in students from various schools and we have some connection to those schools. So we are bringing in students uh, that are part of user experience, design, testing, all of those things, because it's very important to have that aspect. So um, I'm really glad you said that. Answer is yes. See, I knew the answer was yes. So just you guys got to come up with the why. And, and then just to, to to clarify too, because I know it's it's kind of actually you know relates to the topic at, topic at hand of of whether or not technology is a distraction or enhancement. Is that we're already thinking like when we talk about technology, we're thinking of what is the newest cutting edge technology. But you can you can do a ridiculous amount of guest engagement with fifty cent sensors. Um, and and get a get a, a lot of of just knowledge of what your guests are doing in the space. Like right now, we're doing this project where we've got, you know, uh, literally fifty cent Hall effect sensors that would touch to a magnet that's actually you know that we're sensing movement when we get a, a huge amount of information about what the guests are doing, and then can use that to enhance the experience and the story. So. 50 cents <laughs> versus, you know, a, you know, a $50,000 tracking system. So it kind of covers that whole gamut. But again, it goes back to what's the importance? What are those handles you want to create? And you can clearly, clearly, you know, answer that. I, I will say where for, 
we, I, similar, I love bringing in students. I love going in back and teaching because it's that, that injection of, of new ideas and new thoughts and new approaches. And it really is answering that question. And sometimes we do get caught up in the big and the shiny. And when you're working with students, it's the resources like we're going to we're going to solve this with you know hot glue and, and gaff tape and it's using that to solve that it really is is that creative problem solving that i think is is fundamental to to this and it uh, it definitely applies to technology and the use of technology how can i do this i'm given a five dollar budget how can i create an amazing experience with five dollars for technology so it's a it's a great challenge, and that's what you know. That's what the students are doing with installation art and theater and all that. You know those backgrounds. That's exactly. So I love. There is definitely a place for students in this world for sure. And I think David, you just took it right back to uh, Michael's statement about taking the little Lego pieces of existing technology and re reconfiguring them into another something else that is uh, just as good. I was going to say, I think it's absolutely imperative for designers older than 40, 45, 50 to listen to the easy, young easy there, Conti. Yeah, I know. <laughs> listen to the young designers, the young minds, because they see things differently, see things differently than, mm -hmm. than we do. And it's really important that we get that feedback in order to design and consult uh, and have that consultation be relevant for today. So don't underestimate the power of the, of the young mind. It's absolutely essential for us. So uh, I can also add that um, it, it's it's been mentioned a couple of times so far, but I uh, one one of the one of the best skills that a student can develop and nurture is prototyping. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles, but if if you have an idea for an interactive experience or an experience that involves technology just create a very basic functional prototype of what the, the core interaction is or the core mechanic and just being able to demo it uh even if it's very crude it just goes so much farther than trying to explain it uh so having the ability to prototype i think david even said something about paper prototyping and i'm a huge fan of paper prototyping don't even start to code don't even use any technology until you figure out if it's going to be fun like test test the mechanic with pieces of paper. If it's a currency based thing, you know you can do that. If you're collecting items, it, just try it with paper first, and then play test and revise. So it does not have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be very high level. It it it, it always starts from that place. Otherwise, you're just wasting money while you're developing. I'd add to that very that true. you know we're we're talking about a, a you know some you know fairly you know uh, fairly high level the oftentimes game-based technology is what we've kind of been, you know, talking about right now, but there's a whole gamut of technology out there, right? Like I, I've got a, a big part of my career has been show action equipment and that's a whole different type of technology, right? Uh, and and some of that, especially when you start, start to minimize that down to, you know, tabletop, uh, you know, sort of experimentation can be really interesting, can be really fun. And, you know, uh, trying to utilize uh, different technologies and in many ways, you know, sort of more uh, maybe, you know, lower fidelity sort of technologies can also be really important in, you know, uh, end user experience, even in uh, even in the large, large theme parks, right? Um, when a lot of people can get a little bit tired of, of, of the really, uh, you know, sort of low touch, uh, you know, high visual environments. And so incorporating some of those other sorts of, uh, you know, lower level technologies to bring people, you know, uh, back through a cycle, uh, you know, is also can also be really, really advantageous. And so uh, from a student's perspective, I think that you can you can lean into that and that'll help you also understand the more basic uh, fundamentals of a lot of these technologies that you can then use to advance up. All right, here's another one from the uh, from the crowd that uh, Chris is not eligible to answer since he answered in the chat. Uh, do you see different challenges between theme parks versus museums in employing these technologies? So we're not allowed to talk about the fact that theme parks have way more money to invest in the uh, tech and the r and d. I think you answered the question, honestly. That's uh, the biggest challenge with uh, with going from theme parks to museums. But um, I think for, for us, uh, 
big difference is obviously the audience is a bit different. Um, and the reason why you're going to a museum versus going to a theme park is different. When I'm in a museum, I want to get close to something. I want to dive deep into that subject. I want to learn more about it. And so there really is this uh, sense of information gathering that I want to get while I'm going through that. Whereas when I'm in theme park, uh, as a guest, for me, it's really more about the experience, the immersion, that feeling that I'm getting, um, the the story that I'm kind of going through and learn and having fun. I don't necessarily have to learn anything. I don't need to come out knowing like, uh, you know, all the shapes of shells or anything like that. Um, but I come out knowing like, yeah, I had a great time. I really love that. My family had a great time. The smile on my son's face was lit up the entire time. And uh, I think that's uh, um, definitely a big difference and something that you want to think about when you're designing for a theme park versus museum. Anyone else? No one wants? I will, hey, I will jump in. I agree with everything. I do think also I'm because we're in that museum world is you know they are struggling probably on the finance side but they're trying to get closer uh so much more of the museum space is trying to be more immersive they're they are trying to engage because they're also losing some people that they want to gain and so I, I think they're looking over into the theme space to how to get more into maybe it's edutainment uh and to uh, pull some of those principles in so that would be my only other thing to add I we we found I mean obviously the budgets budgets are always always an issue but we've we have found uh, that museums are more willing to take a risk sometimes especially with these with you know when we're coming up with new technology and I mean a lot of the work too that we do is a science center so they're embracing you know the 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 technology and the R and D effort that might be involved with it but but still I think I I think we found that you know we've done a lot of dog and pony shows but in our earlier days you know for the theme for themed entertainment and it was like trying to get everyone to understand and and embrace it and 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 make those steps forward was a lot trickier than when we went with museums and we we're just like oh yeah we can have you know these types of interactions and exchanges and it's like it's great let's try it and it was that that was a bit of a shock for us and it's happened on more than one 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 client on the in the museum world so i think it's i think one of the things too that was that i uh, that you were saying adam is really kind of hit the point too is the is the relation to the built environment too it's museums don't necessarily have to focus quite so much i know they want to but they're they're obviously focused on how we're going to deliver the material in a really interesting and meaningful meaningful way um, and not have to worry so much about the built environment or themed entertainment uh, or, you know, or theme parks and, and, and that genre, there's a lot more effort and budgets as we put into the built space as well, which is obviously a big cost driver um, for that as well. So, but the, using the same technology, but again, putting it into an environment that has very different cost buckets. <laughs> All right. Um into the super speed death match last uh last one where everyone's gonna have to answer all right i've got uh let me make sure there's nothing else coming in from the audience we Nobody have to anyone? answer for ourselves is that what you're saying yeah no, no well just i want everyone's opinion um <laughs> all right let's see no 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 there it is there it is okay um right now in your each of your opinions uh, I want you to tell me what you feel is the most disruptive technology in existence. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? And we'll start with Brandt because he's the furthest to the left of my screen. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Um, You're welcome. I mean, look, it, the thing that scares me the most, to be perfectly honest with you, is, is AI, right? It's uh, not just because it's new, but because I think that it has the it has the potential to um, to disconnect people from the real world, right? And I know that's a kind of an odd thing to say for somebody who kind of uh, has made a career out of replacing people's known reality with you know some something else. Uh, but I, I think that the thing that makes these sorts of themed environments and and themed entertainment special is that we we're all fundamentally rooted in in something that's real, and so it becomes an escape. And I think that uh, I think that you know I I'm not sure that we necessarily know what sort of Pandora's box we're opening 
uh, with this sort of technology. And um, I, I would love to have the full, the full faith and, uh, and force in, in humanity to, uh, to be able to control it. Uh, but I haven't seen history prove that that is necessarily going to be the case. Uh, so yeah, I would say that uh, I would say that there's a lot of danger there, and I and I and my hope is that people don't uh, lose touch with with reality, so that we can keep on making these sorts of escapes and these sorts of uh, fantastic environments uh, that can be something special uh, and uh, and 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 a bit of an escape from from the normal reality, but that people really don't lose touch with it. David, you're up. Oh no. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Dang I, was it. Hoping, I was hoping I could steal someone else's answers too. Um, I I know it's 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 that's an interesting question. I think I think the we I myself don't usually try to get latched on to whatever the newest and the greatest and and thinking about what is disruptive, but looking <laughs> more at the long term trends. And the thing that that I always come back to is the fact that. I think the maker movement has been the biggest disrupt disruptor, I think, for a lot of the work that we do, mm -hmm. not only for us as designers, but for what our audience expects. They know now, the curtain has been peeled. They know that there is the ability to create these really fascinating connections to, to, to the experiences and to themselves. And having to deliver on that has become quite the you know quite the challenge because the expectation is so much more even just the, the devices in our hands i mean it's we're walking around with little what used to be cray you know cray mainframe computers um mm -hmm. so having that computing power and that ability for information and connection and everything i think that's both with with both with the makers, the, the maker movement and and with, you know, our devices and things that we use for every day, I think I think it's elevated exponentially what the expectation is in an experience. And whether it's good or bad, I personally think it's great. Um, <clears throat> it has put a lot of burden on on us, all of us as designers as to how do we answer that and how do we create those types of types of experiences, knowing what our audience is going to be demanding. So no particular tech, but more of a more of a trend. No, I, lo I love that answer actually. Uh, trailer, you're up. It's funny. I was thinking back to uh, an image on one of Chris's decks where you're in this beautiful museum and there's all this amazing art and everyone's on their phone. I I go <laughs> I go with that one because I I think you know I think. M m how many of us can remember phone numbers anymore? How many of us can find our way without our phone? I, th I think it's, it's a major disruptor. I, and I also agree on AI, but I think AI is the big thing. And then the phone is this little thing. It's so tiny and so small, but our identities, our self-esteem, how many you know connections I have on LinkedIn is all tied to this thing. And I, th I think uh, that's a huge disruptor. And it, it competes. You can have the most immersive thing in the world. And if someone is looking at their phone, wow. Yeah, you know, right. So. Uh, Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I interpreted your question differently, and maybe right or wrong. I interpreted go with your interpretation. I love it. A disruptive technology for the good. You know, in the in the seventies, you know, microprocessors was the disruptive technology. It changed everything for us. In mm -hmm. the eighties, it was video projection, so we could re replace film with, you know, high brightness, high resolution projectors. And, you know, there, there's so many disruptive technologies that were meaningful to me that really changed my way of thinking and designing. And today I have to admit the technology today that is disrupting everything about what we do in, in immersive environments is curved LED. And a perfect example of that is the sphere that just opened up in Las Vegas. Oh. It, is, it, is, it is the ability to create domed or curved or immersive environments that completely wrap around you without creating shadows like Michael showed in his little sketch where you know a ride vehicle interrupts the, the projection cone. Forget the projectors. You can now create curved surfaces and envelop the retinas of, of a person's viewing distance and completely create an immersive environment like we've never done before. So I think that technology alone is going to be a great disruptor for everybody. And it's going to make a make for a better guest experience for sure. 
It's really good. I love that. Uh, let's see, Adam, you're up. Yeah, so uh, Chris, you took a little bit of where I was going to go originally, thinking uh, let's start with the transistor, the uh, you know the basic building blocks of the computer, the thing that I spend all of my time on every nice. single day. That I think literally everybody here and everyone in most industries spends all of their time on. Um, if I'm thinking more a little bit towards kind of immersive experiences and things like that, for me, honestly, it's um, uh, I think visual programming is is a big one, but I think the uh, uh, commodification of game engines and uh, the consolidation of game engines to have uh, big, easy repositories for people to come in, have a toolbox, and immediately start building something interactive and visual is huge. And we're seeing it all over the place, not just in entertainment uh, theme parks. Uh, obviously, we're seeing in XR stages, film production. Uh, we're seeing in high uh, simulations, the digital twins from Michael. Um, it's literally everywhere and it's going uh, and it's using so many processes that span so many different uh, verticals and, and different professions that uh, I really think it's changed how we work fundamentally. Um, and I would put that on a level as like, you know, having a uh, CAD on the computer, um, obviously Ooh. going from from paper uh, architecture all the way to, to digital um, completely changes that workflow. Um, so, yeah, I think that's where I stand. Love it. Peter? Yeah, actually, I mean, so many good points. Uh, definitely having not only uh, the templates or the libraries of all those assets to create these worlds with, but then you integrate AI. And um, I'm actually really excited. I'm going to the Sphere tomorrow. So I'm super excited. Every time oh, so about jealous. It, just totally uh, incredible. But um, yeah, for, for me, it is, you know, technology for technology's sake gets in the way. It's always about like, how do we just compel people to great stories? And, uh, and you know, and so that's, uh, uh, I don't know, an outlier on there, which is kind of dead. I'll probably get a uh, flack for it, but uh, NFTs and just the whole idea that you can actually track these creations eventually as AI takes over or gets implemented. How do you actually use um, blockchain to actually track individuals and their experiences and their gamification within an experience. And then once they leave your experience and they watch a movie or they interact at home with that, how do you actually go through? But we're seeing uh, people using blockchain and actually commoditizing whether it's the characters or even the, the individual guest users, which is very interesting application of it because we haven't seen any good applications of that stuff, but uh, it could be very interesting because then you're talking open data sources and stuff. So. so wait, did you just say NFT is not dead? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> I think as it's been sold, yeah, as it's been sold and hyped up, totally. But the idea that there is uh, almost like unique DNA that is traceable and that, uh, you know, especially when you start creating characters. So we're working with some people now who are trying to create a character, let's say a movie character, an animated character, mm. um, that you can actually put an NFT with them. And then that character can then be brought into a video game, can then be brought into <laughs> A destination entertainment and what tracks that they are unique and their memories and everything that's programmed with that um and that it hasn't been modified down the 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 chain is using a blockchain and then how you actually verify that that is that unique uh sentient ai being is is through an nft so yeah that's why i, I know it's it, okay well, it'll this probably is great. Be things, but... nfts ai blockchain <laughs> I don't even yeah. have another set of uh, initials here to go to. Yeah. All right, uh, let's bring it home with uh, Michael Libby and Phil Hedema is not the biggest disruptor. What you got, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I do think uh, the answer has to be AI. Um, we but we we've, we've talked about it at length um, in other sessions, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna disrupt every industry, not just ours. Um, so just in the interest of saying something different, uh, I, I think the biggest disruptor, disruptor to our industry is the democratization of user-generated content uh, and, and things like um, influencers on social media, you know, going around Disneyland, creating content about buying a popcorn bucket or something and you know, everybody's not watching premium TV anymore. This is what they're watching. They're watching TV of other users that have created content. And then things like uh, Roblox and Fortnite, where people are creating 
environments for others to experience or creating games for others to play. Uh, I think that's going to be a real competition. Um, you know, these, these other at home experiences and there's, you know, there will be an expectation for, um, you know, guests to be able not to just experience something, but to actually, you know, create part of the experience. So I'm, I'm hoping that we start to think of our, um, you know, our theme parks, our museums, all of our destinations as less of a singular experience and more of a platform uh, that can play back multiple experiences um, so that new experiences can come and then and then be played or be experienced uh, that are either designed by professionals or designed by the guests themselves. Um, because that is part of the expectation now is I, I don't want to just experience it. I want to actually have a role in the creation of it. Excellent. All right. I think uh, we have run over by three minutes, which is a world record quickest um, that I've been able to extricate from one of these. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, this was really um, thought provoking, uh, interesting. I really appreciate everyone's time and expertise and willingness to share. Uh, there were a couple questions in the chat about contact. Uh, every single one of us on the panel is on LinkedIn. I'd say start there. We'll get back to you, I promise. Um, if anyone doesn't get back to you, please don't tell me about it. I don't care. No, I do care. Let me know. And I'll poke professionally. Um, let's uh, wrap it up and uh, call it a night. Uh, gratitude to all. And uh, See you guys at the next event.